welcome to Feeling Hot, 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 a heatwave symposium. And I have to say, I think it's absolutely incredible how we've made this a lived experience and how we've really dialed up the weather just so you can feel a little bit sweaty when you come in here tonight. And believe you me, that's exactly how we will be feeling in 2025 when our climate has changed. My name is Amanda Blair and it gives me great pleasure to be here tonight as your facilitator for this incredibly important symposium. I must admit that when the um, when the, the email actually came through uh, from my agent saying, look, you know, we'd really like you to do this event, and it was called Feeling Hot, 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 I thought to myself, thank God someone is finally recognising my menopause in a public forum. So, <laughs> you know... It was great. But I must say, I wasn't disappointed at all to know that we would be talking about climate change because it is a very important subject to me indeed, as it is to each and every one of us. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that the land that we meet on today is the, tradi is the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we acknowledge and respect their connection to place both past and present. And I have to think that if we maybe left the lands to the Aboriginal people, we wouldn't be experiencing climate change. But that's about all I'm going to say on that issue. Um, tonight, we have got such a tremendous event for you. And obviously, we would really like to get the word out as much as is humanly possible. We would urge you, please, to tweet throughout this event and to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have our very own hashtag, and for those of you that were teenagers in the 60s, that might have a whole different meaning. But tonight, it is a social media hashtag. It is hashtag Resilient South or hashtag Climate Ready South. And of course, all of our Twitter handles are there. Uh, and they are the Twitter handles, I might add, from the people that have brought this together, the Resilient South group. Who are the Resilient South group? Well, they are four councils who have put this event together, who have all made a declaration and a decision that climate change and how we act around climate change is a priority, which I think is to be commended. So when I've finished reading out our four councils, please a round of applause. We have got the City of Mitcham, the City, in, city of Marion, Onka Paringa and Holdfast Bay. And I'm sure many of you live within those uh, council areas and you should think yourself very lucky that you have such responsible councils that are guiding uh, our local communities because I think they're doing a great job. They have, Resilient South have been working together since 2011 and in 2014 Resilient South was recognised as a national climate change champion. So that's also another wonderful accolade. Uh, they have identified climate risks and opportunities and they have adapted plans to suit. Uh, for those of you that were here earlier, we were hearing from some of our mayors talking about some of the things that have been going on at a local level like more tree planting and better stormwater catchment and ways to take care of the environment to help the uh, climate change environment. So each council has been working with communities to support this preparation and and heatwave is something that we all acknowledge is a major risk that will worsen over the years to come. And lots can be done to mitigate those risks and we'll be going through them tonight with our extraordinary panel. Before we get to them though, I would also like to just thank our partners, the SES, Red Cross and Adelaide Mount Lofty Rangers NRM Board. Please a round of applause for them too. <laughs> You would have seen their stalls out in the foyer coming in. Many of you have availed yourselves of the lovely High Viz SES show bag. Please make sure you take one of those home uh, before you leave tonight and engage with all of our stall holders out in the foyer at the end of this session. We'll be telling you exactly what they're up to a little bit later on and I'm sure that you are all going to want to connect. So let's go now to our panel. Uh, it's an amazing panel and we are so, so privileged to have some of our real community leaders here with us tonight. And while I introduce them, what we decided we'd do is we'd try and be just a little bit kooky, a little bit original, and we would give each of them, we spent, a, oh, 
three minutes maybe in deep thought, uh, trying to work out what little sound effect we could have <laughs> for each panel member. So, you know, as I read out their, their introductions, we're going to have like a little musical, a little audio grab that will set the scene about what this person is actually all about, all the, all the sorts of work that they are all about. So in no specific order, well, we'll start from here, actually. Can we hear from, and again, a round of applause, please, at the very end of the introduction, once you've heard the music and have hopefully had a bit of a laugh. Uh, he is from Hackham East Primary School. He has a job that not many of us put our hands up for. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. He is a school principal. Please put your hands together for Bob Tearley. <laughs> Wait. Hey, teacher, leave kids alone. <laughs> now you can applaud. Craig Hobart joins us now. He is the Club Development Coordinator for the City of Onkaparinga. So he is the man that is in charge of lots of football grounds and lots of soccer grounds and lots of our recreational spaces. So his sound effect is... <laughs> That's right. A siren. Chris Beatty joins us. Now, he is a man who has been working extremely hard and I always think about him and his crew whenever disaster strikes in Adelaide. He's the Chief Officer for the SES. a long siren that was good that was a really good siren right so our next guest or our next panelist I should say uh, runs the Hutt Street Centre in Adelaide which are the largest providers of uh, meals and services to people who are homeless in Adelaide it gives me great they're also our charity partners tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr Ian Cox <laughs> That was the sound of angels singing, for those of you that haven't heard that before. That, <laughs> that would be me. Uh, now, I love this man. I really do, because, I, again, I think to myself sometimes, oh, my God, this is such a hard job. It's such a hard job indeed, because he is the emergency manager. I mean, seriously, would you want this job? He is the emergency manager of SA Power Networks. Can we please uh, have the sound effect first for Mr Frank Krishki? Krishki. Bureau of Meteorology. I love BOM. I think BOM do an excellent job. They really do. And I'm constantly amazed at their high pressures and their low pressures and their seven day forecasts. And it's all too much. Uh, here with us tonight, we have the State Director of the Bureau of Meteorology, Mr. John Nairn. Uh, not taking away the intellectual ca uh, capabilities of any of our other uh, members on the team, but we do have tonight Larissa Nichols, who is doing a uh, she's doing a PhD on. Uh, no, you've already done a PhD? Yes, you've already. Yeah, she is a doctor. See, dumb. She's not. She is a doctor at RMIT University. She's a research fellow currently too. So here is her sound effect which is nothing, that's the sound of her brain working over time. <laughs> that is the sound of her brain. Just white noise and study hard. Uh, where would we be? Larissa's done some really interesting stuff about community and how community responds in these sorts of events. I can't wait to talk to her in just a few moments' time. We also have SAPOL. Where would we be without SAPOL? We have with us tonight, Noel Bamford, the Assistant Commissioner. I wanted women in uniform, but it just, you know, 
They wouldn't let me have it, sadly. Uh, also tonight, another great panellist, and again, I just commend all of the organisers for assembling this team tonight. He is the Chief Medical Officer for SA Health, a very important job indeed, Professor Paddy Phillips. Mm, another siren. And for you, what I wanted was the theme song to carry on again, Doctor, but they wouldn't let me have it, unfortunately. Far too politically incorrect. Uh, we have... Uh, we don't have Paul, do we? We have Rose Rhodes, PSM, Chairperson for the SA Divisional Advisory Board of the Australian Red Cross. In the Uh, love this woman. She does a tremendous job. She has a massive, massive job indeed because she's the Chief Executive of the Department of Water, Environment and Natural Resources, the wonderful Sandy Pitcher. And finally, one of our sponsors, uh, the General Manager, City Services for the City of Marion, where we are tonight, Mr Tony Lyons. That's just applause and cheering. Right, so let's go to our slides now. We will head into our uh, night. We are going to be having a Q&A session at the end of the evening. So if you have any questions at all, please write them down uh, on a piece of paper, preferably not on the chair because Tony will get quite upset with you for you know defacing the property. But if you've got any questions at all, if you please write them down and we will be out there with a roving microphone at the end of the session. So this is true. Uh, climate change impacts. What does it mean? It means, and this is already happening, in case you haven't actually worked it out, climate change is already happening. The impacts on southern Adelaide, more frequent, long-running and intense heat waves, more extreme fire danger days, less rain but more intense storms and flooding, and sea level rise, more coastal erosion and storm surges. So tonight's focus, heat waves, are predicted to become much more frequent in time, intense and long running. And for our region to remain vibrant and resilient to the impacts of climate change, we need to work with our communities to prepare and adapt. Southern Adelaide is getting hotter. And in fact, the world is one degree warmer. Uh, what we've got here, and this is, actu this is actual science, so this is not us sitting down with a PowerPoint presentation going, ooh, let's make up lots of figures and scare everyone. This is actually fact. This is climate change fact. And by mid-century, you want to write this one down, this is scary. By mid-century, Adelaide is more like Gawler not in the amount of people with tattoos and really bad haircuts. It's not happening like that. Uh, it's more like Gawler in terms of temperature. And by the end of the century, more like Port Piri. So by the end of the century, more like Port Piri in temperature. So that is quite scary indeed. Uh, the world... Oh is getting warmer and it's going to get so much hotter and so what's going to happen is more and more people are going to move to colder climates. Where's there a colder climate? Tasmania. So right now in Tasmania you can buy a magnificent three bedroom, one bathroom house with four car parks, which is great because you need to move the Kingswood in order to get to the Monaro and then you need to manoeuvre the Monaro in order to get to the Sigma. Uh, so you'll need your four cars down there, $269,500. So you might want to think, ladies and gents, about packing up and going to Tasmania unless you want to live with the sorts of heat that they're experiencing in uh, Port Piri. So what's happening in 2024? And that's what we're doing tonight. 
We're not talking about the heat this week. We're not talking about what's happening this week. We're talking about 2024. And each and every one of us now is just going to wind the clock forward to 2024. And it's amazing how you all look exactly the same. The skincare and the SPF 50 is clearly working a treat. Keep it up. And the fashions haven't changed too. Thank God for that. All right, so we have all moved forward to 2024. It's November 2024 indeed. And Australia is experiencing an intense El Nino. The Bureau of Meteorology has prepared its summer outlook for summer 2025 and Southern Adelaide is preparing. Hello and welcome to the Bureau's Climate and Water Outlook for January to March 2025. An El Nino is now well established across the tropical Pacific Ocean. El Ninos are generally associated with warmer and drier conditions over Australia, particularly during summer, with an increased chance of extreme temperatures. Now every El Nino is different and climate models suggest that this particular event will continue to be strong and last until at least autumn. This means that impacts over Australia are likely to be stronger than during previous El Ninos. Parts of South Australia and Victoria have experienced well below average rainfall for this time of year. This has meant early harvesting of wheat crops. Sustained dry conditions in the South Australian Murray lands and into Western Victoria has also seen grass fires start early, impacting livestock and property. Summer heat has arrived early as well in parts of southeastern Australia. Adelaide's average maximum temperature for November was four degrees above average, with December conditions expected to be at least one to two degrees warmer than average as well. With El Nino firmly established in the Pacific Ocean, warmer and drier conditions are likely for much of the country, particularly in the south, and the southeast. In terms of temperature, daytime and nighttime temperatures are likely to remain well above average for southern and southeastern Australia. So in summary, 2025 is likely to start much warmer than average for southeastern Australia. So please keep an eye out for severe weather warnings in the coming weeks and months. Dr. John Nan, you are the State Director of the BOM and currently doing your PhD on heat waves. Firstly, when did you first decide that you needed to do a PhD on heat waves? Why is it, why is it so important to us? Look, it became apparent because we'd been through uh, some uh, really interesting uh, power events in 2006 where... Um, um, not Frank's fault. Come no, on, no, give no, him no. a break. But unfortunately, Frank was copying it in the teeth. <laughs> and um, it became apparent that uh, the definition that we were using in Adelaide for heatwave just wasn't uh, cutting it. And, um, and then when you consider that the only place in Australia that had a heatwave definition was Adelaide, um, it became really apparent that we were lacking tools to actually understand our history of heatwaves. So we were the only state to recognise a heatwave. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 okay. Adelaide was the only place to recognise... Adelaide, the city? The city of Adelaide wow. was the only place. And I can say that the only reason why we had a definition, and this tell, talks to the state of the science, was because one day in 1990, the media came knocking on our door and said, could you please place this current heat wave in context? Um, my colleagues ran out the back and rattled a few fingers, figures around and came up with the five days of 35 and three days of 40 definition. And that meant they could go back into their record and look at lengths of heat wave, not intensity, but just lengths of, and offer a context. And that was the only demand that we had at that time to look at heat waves. Now, we've been through a few that we've started to pay attention to, mm. and we needed something better so that we could actually consider the impacts across our entire community. I believe all of Australia, Australia and indeed globally, people deserve to understand heat waves better and that's what got me going. Is it just me being a kid when I once upon a time, a long time ago, and maybe, or I have failing memory, but I, I, make, I think it feels so much hotter than it used to, much hotter than a couple of degrees. Um, so not only are heat waves highly variable in their intensity, so you may have experienced in your own personal circumstance 
a lot of different intensities of heat waves. So if you were lived back in 1939, you experienced one just like 2009. I don't know if you're around at that time. Well, look, the face the face cream's but, quite good, but, but would, not that. But good. I would also say that Paddy could probably comment quite well <laughs> on on our, how our subjective experience of heat waves will change according to our age. So there are times at which we will be much more able to cope with heat waves, and yeah. then progressively get older, and you start to. Um, have other conditions that make mean that you will experience it differently. And that is a part of the confounding thing about heat waves because people don't understand that. They buy the cultural story that we're great around heat waves and they live it for their entire lives. But that's not the truth. Yeah. Both the intensity changes and your vulnerability changes. And that's a really important part of the story. No, oh, absolutely it is. We're gonna hear a lot from Patty shortly about how we are all affected by heat waves. Thank you for that, John. I'm gonna throw open to uh, Chris now, who is of course the state, uh, the chief officer for the SES. And considering the fact that this is actually real data, that these are real estimates of how hot it's going to be in 2025, what, uh, is the SES doing now to prepare for that heatwave event? Well, the agency's uh, preparedness arrangements, I, th I think it's important to understand the, the, the context of firstly why SES is involved in coordinating the state's response. And it does stem back to 2009 and there was a, a fairly significant heatwave then for 14 days of uh, very high temperatures. Uh, we had an enormous number of presentations to the state's hospitals, infrastructure damage, a significant number of uh, excess deaths associated with that event. And you know, the state government and the emergency management agencies came to the conclusion that there really needed to be a control agency and a hazard leader responsible for coordinating uh, the state's response. And for its sins, uh, the SES is the hazard leader for extreme weather and we picked up that role. And since that time, right through to 2025, the arrangements have been maturing and um, been refined as we learn more from the science and also as we learn about the efficacy of our interventions. And so in the lead up to 2025, we could expect to see all state government agencies collaborating uh, prior to the event with pre-season uh, training, briefings, plan reviews, confirmation of warning systems, exercising and so on. We would see our senior officials briefed on the levels of preparedness. We would see a subcommittee of the cabinet briefed on uh, heatwave preparedness coming into this season. Uh, by that stage, we would have also convinced government to fund a well-coordinated and, uh, and well-resourced community education program that would be reaching out to not just households but also businesses to ensure that um, all segments of society are taking steps to ensure that their facilities, infrastructure, equipment are ready for the coming months. Uh, just tell me one thing though, in 2025 you haven't changed your uniform, have you? It's still the beautiful, lovely orange, which looks great on everyone, particularly if you've got a large thigh. I've always thought that. So I don't want that to change. No, no, the orange will still be there, I'm sure. In Good man, very happy about that. All right, let's now fast forward to November 2024. In, no, in fact, we're going to straight to 2025. Let's all imagine ourselves driving along in our cars. It's about, so, it's about seven o'clock at night. We're driving along in our cars. Leon Biner's still on the radio. Uh, there's still roadworks on South Road. <laughs> which is annoying, uh, everyone's still whinging about everything and there are still some people saying that the Adelaide Oval was a waste of money, even still. Uh, Richmond, by the way, are still dominating in the AFL. I barrack for Richmond, so you'll just have to deal with that in 2025. Right now, though, you're in your cars, you turn on your radio and you hear this. Online, on DAB Digital Radio and on 1395 AM. Talking Adelaide. This is Adelaide's 5AA. 
Good evening. South Australians are being urged to take care this week with a run of temperatures forecast to trigger heatwave conditions. Temperatures are set to soar into the 40s, with the Bureau saying there is no immediate relief in sight. Today's expected top is 35, with a minimum low temperature of 26. And for the remainder of the week, the temps will be 40, 42, 43, 44, 43 and 44, with the minimum overnight temperatures remaining in the mid-30s. Public schools are due to recommence after the summer break today, but due to hot weather policy, the department is only keeping schools open until 12pm on days where the temp will exceed 38. This is causing havoc for families and businesses across the state. Authorities warning people to show precaution and to stay indoors and be hydrated. A code red plan has been issued by authorities to provide assistance to hundreds of homeless people across the state. Wow. All right, so the first one there that jumps out at me is the fact that it's been the school holidays. These are people with parents I'm talking to here. It's been the school holidays. You've already had your kids at home for six long, <laughs> horrendous weeks where you've tried to stop them fighting. You've tried to pretend that you actually enjoy spending time with them, but yet actually in the back of your mind is this little niggling thought going, come on school, for God's sake, would you come back? Come back school. And then you hear the weather warning that says the kids can't go back to school because it's too hot. What do you do? And seriously, this is massive. If you've got kids, which hello, a lot of us have, and they can't go to school, what's gonna happen to you with work? But firstly, Bob, let's go to you. What's gonna happen to the schools? How do you get that message out to all of us that I'm sorry, there's no school, it's too hot? Um, well, I'd be hoping that Leon Biner would be, um, you know, saying it over the radio so everyone would definitely be, be hearing it. It, it was, um, an issue, we foresaw it, um, and because we had a hyper, hypothetical machine or something, and we were able to see and predict this, so we had a hypothetical Tesla battery installed in our, <laughs> our school, which made things much easier because we could uh, keep the air conditioning working. Um, our school uh, is um, made of asbestos, and anyone knows that asbestos is virtually indestructible. And because it's indestructible, uh, our department doesn't feel the need to ever upgrade it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's 45 years old back in, in 2018, and so now it's like much older. And it's still, you know, very hard to cool, very hard to insulate. And so um, the air conditioning's not all that good either. So to keep children at school uh, beyond midday would be rather, rather difficult. Now, to get that word out to parents is one thing, especially, I was predicting a hypothetical uh, power failure as well, um, statewide, and if that was the case, how do you get the word out? Yeah. Because your electronics don't work, your internet doesn't work. Um, we would be really up, you know, we'd be quite hot under the collar, I would say. Mm. So um, the, all we could think of was sort of getting a laptop and tethering it to your phone and then trying to send out your SMSs to everybody, you know. Um, but you couldn't operate OSH or anything like that. You couldn't have any after-school hours care, could you? And parents basically have to, be, have to stay home. And what we And found, teachers have to stay home. And, and parents want the absolute best for their kids, but they also have to work. Yeah. And we have found in our, communi our school community, at times, parents won't come and pick their kids up. So therefore, we've got a situation where we have to keep our kids cool and um, if the air conditioning doesn't work, uh, what are our options? Now, our oval died years ago uh, because of lack of rain, yeah. right? And so we've got bark uh, on the oval and scrub, um, you know, where we were, had nice green grass. Um, so we've got a snake problem. So the thought of taking the children out under the tree and squirting them down with oh. the hose to keep them cool was, you know, a, a big ask, especially when the tree <laughs> started self-pruning. <laughs> onto the children. So therefore, uh, sending them home was actually a lot safer than keeping them <laughs> at school. In keeping fact, them with Uncle Bob at Hackham East. Yep. Yes, uh, teachers were um, putting their hands up to, take the, to deliver the children to home.
That's great. I'll tell you, I know where I'm going to send my kids. I'm going to go, you're going down to that snaky oval at Hackham East if you don't behave yourself. But that is, that is a real concern. And it would be interesting too if we had someone from Treasury to actually start to think about the numbers. You know, the, the impact on that financially on our community would be high. Speaking of numbers and budgets and government money, I'm going to go straight now to Paddy Phillips, the Chief Medical Officer, because Paddy, we already have an enormous health budget and and we have, I might add, a beautiful hospital, but it costs us a lot of money, particularly when patients are in there. It's a damn shame about those patients, isn't it? But what happens when there's a heat wave? I mean, we hear about it all the time. We hear about the impact. Rose will be talking to you about this too. You know, people still get, well, they get very heat affected, no matter how many times you tell them to drink water and no matter how many times you tell people to stay indoors, there is still a huge overreach when it comes to presentations in the emergency department? Yep. So 2009 was a, 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 and 2008 were the two really severe heat waves that, that actually taught us a lot. And, and thanks to some research done at the University of Adelaide and, and through Monica Nitschke, who's in the audience in the Department of Health, we, we, we learnt a lot out of those. And what we learnt, and, and John was involved as well, is it's the average daytime and nighttime temperatures, the combination. If you cool down during the night, the impacts are less. But if you have high temperatures for prolonged periods, and it's about three days, hence the issue of a heat wave being about three days, morbidity and mortality rises. 2009 saw um, a change in our presentations from previous heat waves over the previous roughly 20 years. And what we saw is that uh, ambulance call-outs went up, went, were well over double from about 4% in heat waves previously to the 2009 one that uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, um, emergency department presentations went up. Hospital admissions doubled from about 8% to 16%. And mortality went up uh, by a huge amount, 10% more mortality compared to zero mortality associated that we could find associated with previous heat waves. It happens after about three days where the community itself heats up, houses heat up, people heat up. And the people who are vulnerable are the old and frail in particular, those in particular with renal, cardiac and mental health issues and who are taking medications for those, those who are socially isolated, who live alone and, um, and who are in lower socioeconomic and educational uh, status areas. Um, heat waves are a big deal and they do cause morbidity and mortality. 2009, the mortuary in Adelaide was full and the, uh, the coroner's office had to rent freezer space. Wow. Uh, code red, we heard that in our news bulletin and I've never heard of a code red before. I'll go to Ian Cox from the Hutt Street Centre. If I'm driving along and I've heard that the state's in code red, I'm telling you right now, something's happening to my back passage. I'm a little bit nervous. What does it mean? Well, it's, it's um, when the authorities decide, obviously, with the... Um, and I guess working in homelessness that um, we need to activate not just Code Red for homeless people but um, for the community. So for a Code Red for Hart Street Centre, being a homeless organisation means we all, um, we, we sort of work in turn with another organisation and we take turns. So we may well have a Code Red activated tomorrow so we're um, already anticipating we'll be open tomorrow night and the following night so we'll keep our doors open. We don't normally have our doors open, we're about getting people into housing and being that frontline service, but we'll be open tomorrow night and Friday night. So our role is basically to look after the rough sleepers, those people who are the most vulnerable, suffering from... They're the people of, sleeping in parks. Absolutely. And uh, it sometimes takes a little bit of time to get word out. And if we get a late um, activation, that makes it a little bit harder. But we've got a great staff group who will drive around and um, cover the CBD and make sure that um, people know where to, where to come to for the night and that we're open and... We'll make sure we've got pizzas and water and um, all of those sort of facilities. But yeah, it's, a, um, it's one thing we actually enjoy doing because it's, it's nice to take ourselves out of the comfort zone. And one of the things which is probably heartening was a number of programs or projects at the moment. We're working with Red Cross and a, a number of people in here as well. Um, looking at what do we do into the future, so in, in, including into um, 2025 and those things. And we need to involve our... You know, I don't really like the word clients. I prefer to say our friends who come through our doors. 
where you know we need to involve them and we're hoping that we can employ some as peer educators so that when there's a, um, a code red um, and sometimes a code blue for the for um, when we are at when winter times that they're the first people we go to who can really rally the uh, the group out there who are doing it tough and they'll be that point of contact and they'll share that information share resources um, with that group and hopefully we can avert any disasters along the way. You do a fantastic job. You really always have to think about our most vulnerable through any major heat event. Go, Rose, I'll go to you now because when there is a code red, uh, you're immediately at the Red Cross. You're pretty much activated and your tele service is amazing where you call these vulnerable people that Paddy was talking about and you try and talk them through these heat waves. What exactly goes on there? It's actually a free telephone service where we make currently in 2017, we make, oh, 2018, we make over a thousand calls to people in the community in South Australia who are most at risk. Our focus is on people being prepared to look after themselves and also others, uh, older family members, their neighbors. So if you go up to 2024, Hopefully, we will probably have visual Skype telecross ready, where we can actually also see people visibly to assess their condition. Now, going on with what Paddy just said, the hospital is stretched. The ambulance is really uh, being called double, probably treble by then. So our aim is to ensure that people are well prepared, looking after others, so that, in fact, Calling an ambulance and being admitted to hospital is actually the last resort. Just on that, in an extreme heat wave, and this is something that I learnt through this process, uh, through extreme high temperatures, air conditioning systems fail in 2025 during this heat wave on trams and trains. Frank, I'm sorry to tell you, but that happens. And there's no evidence of buckling rail lines. However, trains are asked to operate 20 kilometres slower than normal as a precaution. And also, this happens, and this is true, when the roads get to a certain temperature over a period of time, the heat causes bleeding of bitumen on older roads and traffic signal failures and the bleeding of the bitumen means that all of the rough surface on the bitumen pretty much melts down and the roads are really smooth which can cause all sorts of traffic accidents. Now Patty, I'll go back to you, how does the ambulance service actually deal with this uh, when you know they're trying to transport people quickly into the hospital but they can't drive fast on the roads? Well, the ambulance service has uh, implemented a whole lot of um, uh, uh, see and treat measures, and so as and the prevention has been improved so much through Telecross Ready, but also through uh, patients' home uh, uh, care assistant, which is an automated computer provided free of charge by the federal government oh. um, that helps people with warnings. A few people just fell off their chairs then at that <laughs> point. That helps people with warnings about what they should do automatically uh, should certain temperature triggers uh, happen, that they're warned about um, closing the blinds or in fact their home uh, computerised system automatically closes the blinds or curtains. It reminds them about drinking plenty of fluids during the day. It um, automatically uh, has pre-programmed those who need to change their medication regimes so that they don't take the medications that can predispose them to dehydration. So therefore the ambulance services are needed less, but those that do use uh, video technology to uh, link up with doctors in the ambulance headquarters and provide intravenous fluids, should it be necessary, so they don't have to go to hospital and so that they um, are treated in, in, in place. So there's a lot more prevention, there's a lot more treatment at home and fewer transportations that need to happen. Um, of course, people won't be on the road because they'll be at home in cool uh, climates, in, mm. they'll be or at work, or if they don't have air conditioning, even in 2025, they'll be in government buildings which will be kept open so that they can stay cool in those places. So there will be less people on the roads, they'll be able to travel safely. Bring on 2025. What else can those machines do for me at home? Uh, let's talk to you, Craig, about the impact on all of our sporting clubs uh, when, when you know, you've got these heat events that are here and, of course, school's cancelled, everything else is cancelled. How do you cope with that? The, the idea is that people stay at home where it is 
um, cooler, they have access to water. Um, but with the uh, program sporting events and stuff that go on, so in the lead up to these sort of heat waves is changing the time that activities occur, so moving it to early in the day or late in the evening where that exposure is far less is something that we really try to encourage clubs and, and sports to think about. Um, now, the last couple of weeks has been really interesting looking at uh, cricket in, the, in Sydney. The centre pitch was you know, something near 57 degrees while the players were out there. Some of the players were hospitalised. A number of people in the audience were hospitalised as well. Um, and that's kind of the area that we're trying to... Because cricket's so boring, that's generally what yeah. happened. Eh? <laughs> that's what would have happened to me. Um, <laughs> no comment on that. Um, but uh, we do look at some of our uh, major facilities now, really starting to think about how they look after the patrons, not only the players. And that's the big thing that I think we're trying to push some of our uh, clubs to think about is it's not only the players. We do that quite well. We look at the kids that are going out and play. We change, we stop playing when it's getting hot. Yeah. We don't generally think too much about the spectators and the parents and the siblings that are running around the outside while the uh, kids are having to uh, time doing physical activity. So out in our parks and stuff, we've, we were really good at making open spaces, um, but we seem to have taken out a lot of trees making those open spaces because we didn't want branches falling on ovals, we didn't want leaves. So now looking at that sort of heat mapping that we've done across the southern region, how can we start looking at putting some trees back so that we're providing shade and shelter for the, the people that are sitting around watching sport as well? So there's some of the areas that we're looking at but, uh, and introducing more hydration breaks as well. Yeah, really, really important, but I think...